three words in there. It is really a great honor and a privilege to be introducing our seminar speaker uh, today. Uh, as you see here, uh, this is uh, Dr. Halo, our principal scientist and also my program leader. <laughs> uh, before I start, I would like to uh, acknowledge the presence of, uh, if you may, give me some time, a few minutes, a few seconds. He's introducing Dr. Miao, who is also our former division head in plant pathology from 1982 until he retired in 2004. And he was the one who hired Hey and myself. Okay, so you see some vintage here. Now, uh, I would like to introduce A here. Uh, he's, uh, as I mentioned, he's our principal scientist, one of our very few principal scientists, and plant pathologist, program leader for genetic diversity and gene discovery under the rest. Uh, he's still very young. I'm more senior, <laughs> I would say. And uh, during the years uh, of uh, his uh, more than 30 years, doing rights research, he has accomplished a lot of uh, achievements, okay? Here you see a list of uh, experiences, starting from, of course, currently a principal scientist at EWI, and then he was also, he's also uh, an affiliate professor at Colorado State University, a leader research for comparative genomics under GCP, Generation Challenge Program, and of course our plant pathologist, and then way back in Washington State University, when he came to uh, Washington State University from Ely and then came back. And so uh, our association started way back during that time. And here I would like to be very proud in also saying that he has uh, held, uh, or he has had several awards and recognitions. He has been a fellow of our prestigious uh, American Phytopathological Society. Uh, also a fellow of uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science. Also in different countries, he is well loved by our partners and collaborators, well respected in Korea. He received honorary researcher uh, award in RDA in Korea and also in Taiwan. And uh, many of our Taiwan collaborators are also here right now. They're staying here for one week. And uh, I would like to mention, this is a very important award that he recently got, is the Lifetime Achievement Award for Rice Blast Research, and I'm very proud of that. And uh, I think these are his research highlights, as you would see. And currently, his focus is on developing a public genetic research platform to enhance the use and conservation of genetic diversity other than his work in plant pathology, particularly on rice blast. And uh, for those of you who are here, we are all witness to this Lifetime Achievement Award. And I would like to mention also that during that event, Dr. Barbara Valent and Hay, as you see here, are uh, Hay is receiving the award, and Dr. Barbara Valent, who is also a very well-known uh, plant pathologist working on blast, is there to congratulate him. And then you see the picture posted around, and I think uh, you will see that here. Doesn't he look like uh, Obama here? <laughs> I first mentioned it at the, I first noted that at this time. Oh, he looks like Obama. <laughs> anyway, more on that witness to this achievement are his colleagues who also greeted him during that event. Uh, we have here. Dr. Kaiyin Lei from uh, Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences, who has been a long-time collaborator and a very ardent worker on rice blast. And of course, our colleague here, Dr. Bo, Bo, Bo Chow, who is also here, now uh, currently with us uh, in plant pathology and has worked a long, long time with uh, Dr. William Wang, who has been working on blast also almost throughout his life. And then at the bottom, you will see it's very interesting here, the next generation of rice blast scientists. So here, I think we will be witness to a real uh, 
listening the uh, life achievement of him. Thank you, Nod. Someone help me to turn on. How do I turn this? Oh, you can hear me now? Okay. Uh, thank you, Nadi. This is really uh, putting a lot of pressure on me to uh, live up to all the praise that you, you shower on me. And uh, first of all, let me thank the, uh, the seminar committee to, to ask me to give a seminar. Um, I haven't done it for a long time, so I'm a little bit rusty with this uh, you know, giving a they, they talk to a big audience. But I'll try. So, so what I, when I was asked to give a seminar on, uh, on, on the work I do, and, and I said, well, there are many things uh, we did together. And, and so I was, what I like to do is look back a little bit and then maybe highlight a few examples that illustrate the point of using Christ in it, which is right now is our current uh, active uh, program. So I would indulge myself a few couple of minutes on sort of looking back personally, and 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 and, uh, and from there, and then for a reason I did that. Uh, I show you why. So I want to do some reflection, a few minutes, and and then I want to use the right disease uh, disease resistance as a case to demonstrate the use of the right adversity. And then I want to go back to the uh, the next adversity research platform that. Uh, that we are currently engaged in. And then at the end, I'd like to uh, cite some lesson learned and some perspective. Okay. So this is my uh, indulgence. A couple of slides. So I graduated from Wisconsin. And I look back. Uh, the reason I uh, come to Erie is because the person right here, Dr. SHO, is the uh, first Erie pathologist. And he wrote that anyone looking on part of uh, rice pathology will have read the uh, rice disease book. And uh, so at that time, Dr. J.C. Walker, the well-known pathologist, was a professor of uh, Dr. O. Can you hear me? Awesome, and since we're gone. You hear me okay? Yes. Okay. And then my, my professor in Wisconsin was the grand graduate uh, student of J.C. Walker, who was Dr. Grant Clark. And then, when I was in, in, in Wisconsin, I was looking for a PhD project. So Paul Williams sent me to Dr. O. He was on retirement, after retirement, uh, given a small grant, $17,000 from here, to, uh, to revise the book and also have a collection of blast isolate uh, kept in Wisconsin, uh, in, in the university. <laughs> So Dr. O said, you want to work on an important uh, topic? How about figure out why the blast happened is so variable? That's the order. So I was like, delighted about this. And so that's my connection with Dr. O. And that put me to here. And then the second uh, look back, uh, I think, which affect my, uh, my work and career is very much this person on the right hand side of Dr. Paul Williams, my advisor. The left hand side is Dr. James Crow. Now, uh, some of you are geneticists here, and you will have read that book, uh, at least page through it, Introduction to Population in Experience. So I took Dr. Crow's class, and he has a heavy influence on me, on my view about biology, because he basically opened up. Uh, my sort of window of looking at things at the population level. And that, in many ways, affect how I do my work. And, and at some time, certain time in my career, I, I can engage in more of the population analysis. So, so doc, Dr. Kuo unfortunately uh, passed away two years ago. So I'd like to use this opportunity to at least sort of think about him and, 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 and uh, say how much I appreciate him as a my professor. Okay, that's my indulgence. Okay, so some of the disease. 
When we look at this picture, these are the major diseases in, in tropical age, not counting temperate uh, leaf. So you can see a blast, blight, hunger, uh, sheep blight, and a little bit of brown spot here. So you can see the for every disease, you have a different, slightly different strategy. Not everything has host plant resistance, whereas some others, uh, for instance, sheep blight, is still stuck. We don't really have good resistance. On the other hand, uh, glass is well worked out, but then because the pathogen is so variable that you really cannot uh, let go, uh, let up. You really have to constantly reinforcing uh, your 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 control set strategy. And then probably I'll, I'll leave that to a lot of people to talk about. So I'll focus on using glass as an example to show how uh, rice diversity being used, have been used to, to manage the, the disease. So now, disease uh, resistance is a really good trick to demonstrate uh, host diversity, the use of host diversity. So, so for a simple reason, the pathogen is so variable that if you don't use diversity, fight diversity, you, you're stuck. So you basically, it's an arm race between who is the, uh, 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 the, the upper hand in controlling. So obviously, we as a pathologist want to be an upper hand. So many diseases with genetic diversity is a necessity because of the fast changing pathogens. They apply to most of the pathogens that we give. And second, uh, I don't think we need uh, one uh, approach. We need a mix of approach. It's almost like IBM is the best mix to work. So I'll give you some examples of uh, how over the years we explore different ways of, of controlling rice blast. So just to indicate glass is serious problem, uh, this is a, a picture showing varieties in, in, uh, in Korea. And I want to highlight the I will highlight the year uh, 1978. And I was told this story, and since Tom is here, I was told this story that uh, 1978 in Korea, they still, you know, still developing at that time. And, and people are really uh, facing a rice shortage. And you cannot order rice fish uh, every day in a restaurant. You have mix it barley. I think Dr. Mayo told me that. I think it's the, it's the true story. Uh, so you can see that glass was um, glass resistant variety usually break down in uh, two or three years. Okay. So the the reason is that we're using a, a one or two varieties spreading all over the place uh, in wide area, and that there's not enough defense in that. So this one Tongyo was a very popular. It, it's almost the, the green revolution variety. For Korea, and then that after a year broke down, and that's why we have a great crisis in 1978. So if we're not careful, it will come and hurt us again. So this slide just summarizes that, that indeed in in the history of plant uh, uh, and disease control, there are varieties are stable. So durability is not an elusive thing; it's there. But it's just a matter of refining. Okay. So this, these are examples. Uh, Marlborocan in Africa. But there's some debate on it because Marlborocan has not been grown wide area. So we really don't know how to do it. But nonetheless, it's being used as a resistance source. Uh, there are variety of Sika Yang of Fai, Gumei in China. Now, R64 is a decent, is a decent variety for glass resistance because it was released in the mid-80s, and it's only until, oh, I would say, what, five or seven years ago, that you begin to see erosion of the resistance. Okay. Now, I'd like to concentrate using one example here. This San Wang Jian is a uh, Chinese variety grown in South China for over 10 years. Very good resistance, but it was replaced, not because it broke down, but because the quality is not good enough. So in, in South China, they're extremely uh, picky on quality. So some products are actually replaced, not because they, they are uh, susceptible, but they are because they, they don't keep up with the quality demand. So 
I just use a few examples that demonstrate when I, when I came back here the second time, that we focus on this variety. The reason is, is how do you understand what constitutes uh, durable resistance? Is to take something historically that is uh, exhibiting durable resistance and then go backward and dissect it. So in a simple way, uh, this slide just shows you some of the analysis. So this is my student Liu Bing uh, making a becoming an inbred population, start mapping them. So at that time, we were still using RPLP and this is early day. Uh, SSR marker later on. Yeah. So what would the, the, the story is that when we, when we analyze it, dissecting it, it's a combination of major gene, resistant gene, plus smaller gene, that we call a minor QDL, combination of both that give you the resistance. Very logical. But then, um, unless you analyze it, you won't know. And secondly, it's still a challenge because anytime you use this as a parent and cross, they segregate out, then you're reconstituting. So it's very important to tag this gene so you can, you can use marker to reconstitute the genotype okay, in a new background and so on. So this one uh, uh, is still my uh, did this. So what she did was actually dissect them out almost in a like isogenic line and bring them back together. You can see that, okay, uh, without the, let's say the control here, with, with only one QTL, you have some disease. Two QTL, you have better. Three QTL, you almost have a clean, clean uh, uh, plant. So it's that combination of major gene and QTL that give you decent resistance and stability as well. So uh, this, this uh, genotype, uh, some of the, the, the back cross line, we have planted in, in, in Guangdong and, and as well as in Erie. And they've been used, the, the derivatives have been used by breeding program in Vietnam and so on. And what it is showing you is this. We always have very decent resistance over a number of years. Okay. So, so lesson one is that you can constitute resistance if we know what to, to, to put together. And they are fairly stable. So, so that's gene, putting different genes in the genome. So there are alternatives too. I mean, uh, there are system diversity that one can, one can explore. So years ago, that's uh, when Dr. Mel was leading the project, we have a uh, biodiversity grant from ADB. So one component is about disease control. So ended up, we, 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 um, we worked with colleagues in, in Yunnan province. And, and somehow, we learned from the farmers a little bit. And they've been growing patches of, of traditional varieties. Okay. And these tra traditional varieties are usually glutinous varieties. And they're high value in the market. But they're very susceptible to lot. So to make the story short, what they did was interplanting the susceptible, the taller one here, susceceptible variety, the, the panic will stick out about 20 centimeter high. And then in between these are these are hybrid uh, indica. Okay. I think it's in the remember sorry. So by doing this uh, this uh, planting, planting pattern, uh, they are able to control glass on the susceptible high value. The reason, I mean, you can look at it. The reason is the, the uh, microclimate here is not very favorable, unless uh, because the air, the air current go through, and then you don't have that accumulation of humidity. That's one explanation. So it makes sense. So look at this area. It is reaching almost near one million hectare for in, during the time in, in the problem. The huge area. You can see it here. You can see the end. You know, you're just driving through the countryside, that's what you see. Now, there's a very good extension system and incentive to do this as well. Okay. So, uh, right now, probably not as big area right now. Um, Dr. Chu published the paper, uh, the author in the paper. Uh, he said they are extending the concept to other crops. So, so even though this is a, perhaps a regional specific strategy, the concept of using 
diversity in the system is, is, is catching on. Uh, and they, they applied it to other problems. So that's system diversity. So, and I like to uh, go back to how do you, you know, get more diversity in your, in your, in your, in your disease uh, management program. Uh, one is to go deep in the gene pool. So in this particular case, years ago we started uh, uh, integrating uh, wild species. This is a tetrapod um, wild virus, or a rice minute, and then start back crossing to satire. And then we derive some resistance, bacterial blight and blood. So one case is a uh, glass resistant gene for PI9 related label. And that was many years of work. So PI9 is picked up, uh, it's actually a gold cigarette, gold, gold some of it. He uh, and Gu Lan Wang, uh, when we work with Gu Lan Wang, uh, cloned the PI9 gene. So why we clone something? Like, because apparently PI9 is fairly effective across many areas. And then now, Bo is, uh, I, sort of, I bought this slide from Bo. Bo is telling me that the reason why that is so is because the matching gene that trigger resistance, the matching gene in the pathogen, that we call it AVR gene or defector AVR gene, uh, matching this is a very high frequency in the pathogen population. So meaning that population, the pathogen population carry the gene that trigger the interaction of the system. Okay, so so that that understanding is crucial because allow you to use the ABLT's uh, frequency in the pathogen population to predict the durability or effectiveness of your allergy without testing your allergy everywhere. So you can actually begin to sample your, your you can actually, for instance, if you go to Africa, you can ask the question, do the pathogen population have the, the matching gene, pathogen gene that match PI gene, uh, PI9, okay. So for instance, uh, the current data is set that in, um, in, let's say, in Thailand, I can't remember, but in, uh, in Yunnan province again, that 90% that isolate have the AVL9 gene that matching the PI9 gene, okay. So that, to, to me, that is a good translation of understanding pathogen diversity, and then go backward, and not going backward, but uh, formulate your the reading program and see what genes are used. Because not all resistant genes are, are equal; some are better than the other. So, how you select quality resistant genes? Okay. So, I just give you three short examples that uh, how we can achieve stable resistance. Glass. And you can extend this to bacterial blight as well, to some extent. So using different types of genes in a variety, so the first example. Number two, using different varieties in the field or in the region, so it's sort of a system diversity. And then three, using diversity guided by knowledge of the pathogen population, the last example I showed you. But the fact that we are responsible for a lot of regions, so we do need a big arsenal. That lead me to the second topic, which is the genetic diversity factor. Okay. So the reason we can do that now is because the sequencing cost is going low and low by 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 months, I think. So we can talk about population genomics, not the individual. Before back in ten years ago, sequencing by genome. Is becoming headlines. Not anymore. I think right now we talk dealing with a, with a situation where we need to uh, we need to we can capable of uh, looking at the rice collection as a population and then apply the technology. And then what I want to get at from here to here is how we should activate the genetic resources to make them ready to go. Pool of them okay. So this is uh, for those who are not the genomics type. I just uh, provide some background first. 
So when you think about the genome, I would say nearly two decades of genome, starting with the yeast, so about less than 20 years ago. Uh, uh, 1996 is the first eukaryotic genome to sequence. It's only about 13 megabits, okay? And only 6,000 genomes. That's a yeast, okay? But then you look down here, and human, and then rice, finally, 2005. Okay. It's not a long history, but then, the technology moving so fast and then give us opportunity. So, what do we do uh, with this technology? What, what can we, uh, how can we benefit us in our work? Um, so we have a gene bank, we all know that. And then in the gene bank, we have about, we have uh, over 100,000 sessions. And the bank, for, and it's not just us, have, have been serving as a bank, meaning deposit and probably sell them to withdraw, right? Because you don't know what to withdraw to analyze. So it's like a needle in a haystack and you want to find the right thing. So with the sequencing technology available, we can begin to look at diversity in the mind. I think I get it from Ken. I, I love this. Good it? So just a sample of diversity. So, how are you going to capture or make use of diversity like this? Is, okay, let me, let me use this slide to just emphasize the importance of genetic stock, uh, providing that uh, resources for us to, for, for addressing uh, problems. And, and then not only that, it's about conservation as well. But knowing what you have is very important and what you need to preserve. So, um, how do, tech, how do you sort of tech unlock the diversity? I think the, the logical way is to make it a in situ gene bank, meaning that digitalize it with DNA sequence. So in other words, make use of the lower cost technology to sequence a major portion of the genome. And that's our ambition. Now, 100,000 is a huge number, but we, we do start now and gradually build up our, our data. Data set. So the diversity platform has the following uh, components. The natural diversity that I just mentioned uh, available in the gene bank. And then that's not sufficient in my mind. You have to create other genetic stock by which you can validate what you see in the gene bank in a rapid way. And I explain a bit more on that. You need good phenotype. This usually considered some mundane. I mean, you cannot get a graduate student say, you're going to do things like this, measuring. This, uh, this is not a, a attractive thing, a beautiful, you know, like high tech DNA. So I think that period is over. I think people really have realized that the getting genotype becoming the team, but getting phenotype is the exciting part. And then obviously you need informatics to combine to integrate all these data. So I'm going to touch on a little bit of that. So uh, this is a uh, slide uh, Ken provided me. Uh, so this initially we looked at 2,000 lines and working with Susan of course at Cornell. And these are the, I think these are three, I think these are more than 2,000. And then we have a, all the major rice type is in this collection. We put 2,000 pen, diversity pen. And using a chip technology, so don't worry about the technology, but basically genotype technology, all that sequence, um, to, to begin the association analysis. That is, you get phenotype, genotype, and look at uh, association pattern. Very logical. So we are doing that now as we speak. And then what we need to look at the timeline. So this is when the first genome uh, published, uh, 2005. 2008, Yuri made a significant contribution uh, doing 